start the session with the talk by John Martinez of Google Santa Barbara, and he will tell us about quantum hardware development at Google. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my pleasure to be here. You know, I really am enjoying this conference quite a lot because there's a real focus on understanding how to build a quantum computer, and I think the D-Wave, the D-Wave machine, uh, kind of being uh, leading uh, the field in the sense of trying to figure out how to build a useful machine. And I think uh, we've done a lot of basic research for many years now, and I think it's time to get serious about building a useful quantum computer. And in fact, that's the essential reason why uh, I, I decided to move my research lab uh, to Google to try to do that. Um, I've been going to a lot of conferences uh, lately, and there seems to be a shift in thinking towards doing that. And of course, there are starts of several large national programs around the world um, where one of the goal is to try to do something useful. So what's great about this conference is we're kind of leading the field into thinking about how to do something useful and how to build and how to use this computational resource for, um, for you know, doing some kind of useful computation. So because of that, I thought I'd first talk a little bit as I'm looking around and hearing about what people are, are proposing to do, to kind of lay a groundwork what I think is the way to think about how to build a, a useful quantum computer. Uh, and there's lots of different ways that people are thinking about doing that. I'm gonna start with what I call the digital approach, which is kind of the standard gate model approach, where, uh, and in fact, for the theories, you assume no errors. And because of that, you have this hugely large Hilbert space, state space, where you do your computing. That goes as two to the number of qubits. And what's nice is, with this kind of thing, there are really good mathematical proofs of what the power of the quantum computer can be. Uh, and, you know, Shor's and Grover algorithms are just examples, and there's lots of other algorithms, too. Of course, fundamental to this is that you have no errors. So if you want to do anything there, we can do demonstration experiments on these algorithms, but you eventually have to go through error correction to get something. Okay. And we believe this is going to work, and we've done experiments to try to do that. But this is kind of a, a long road. I mean, we have to, we think we can get there, uh, but, uh, and, and do these very powerful uh, 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 algorithms, but uh, it's going to take some time. So I would say the advantage of this is you have this kind of provable exponential power. You, you know that from good mathematical proofs. Everyone believes it's correct. Of course, and one single error kind of destroys these calculations, so you have to do that. Again, you have to require large machines. And of course, what we're thinking about here today in terms of uh, analog, uh, an kind of uh, annealers is kind of looking at an, an I'm gonna call an analog approach, okay? Which is where you just, you assume you're gonna have errors, okay? And then you're going to try to build something practical even though you, you have errors. Now, I, I'm just gonna generalize a lot here and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards, but I'm gonna say compared to the digital realm, we have less refined mathematical proofs uh, on, on how to do this. And I think in general for the analog uh, uh, approach, uh, there's not a firm of a mathematical foundation in, uh, in digital. But of course, with errors, you can think about building practical machines and algorithms right now. And again, this, this conference is all about that. Now, I want to also say, um, as you do that and think about other simulators, there's kind of, there's been kind of a couple things that are said about this kind of approach in general that kind of parallels this. If you're building quantum computers with errors, it is really incorrect to say that you have this exponential state space, this powerful computing power, using the digital no error kind of arguments. So you can't say you have exponential power. It's not obvious at all, because this exponential power comes with no errors, and we have a lot of errors, okay? And that's sometimes said, and sometimes implied, and maybe I've done that uh, on occasion, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but it's just not true. But on the other hand, 
there's uh, conversely, a lot of people say that the only way to do this, only way to use quantum computer is to do that, and that's not correct either, okay? Um, uh, you know, this, this approach, you should be, you, you know, it's incorrect to say you aren't be able to calculate it's not going to be useful because you have errors and you don't have full quantum coherence. So the truth is somewhere in between. So I kind of like to think of it as you have your, uh, you know, linear scaling of classical algorithms, you have this that's kind of unknown, you have exponential uh, power over here, and somewhere in the middle here, there's plenty of room in the middle, to kind of misquote Seinman, to try to do something useful. Because ex you know, exponential power is really great. So even if it's not exponential power, you know, we can do that. So um, uh, in, in this, we have quantum annealing. And I think there's a lot of other systems people are looking at. Uh, I see a lot of people kind of just building these quantum systems and trying to understand the quantum mechanics of it. And I call these kind of self-simulators, uh, you know, uh, simulating couple spins. But it's just kind of simulating the only the system you're building. And that's not necessarily useful in the way that, let's say, Feynman started talking about it, where he said you can build a quantum system to emulate another system. And uh, so I'm kind of breaking this up into self-simulators, which are nice physics, but not necessarily useful to things where you can simulate other things where you can get uh, useful utility out of it. And of course, the quantum annealer, for example, it's fully programmable and you can hope to put mathematical problems on it. So these are the two areas in the analog uh, they're doing it. So given all that, I would say we have to have a deep understanding of the power of these kind of analog machines and the system requirements to be able to do something useful. And I'm just going to say that this is a frontier of physics right now in our field. And I'm even going to boldly say this is the big frontier of our field right now. If we want, really want to try something useful, let's you know, try to un understand both experimentally and theoretically what's the power and how to get there and how to put together our systems to give power, maybe not exponential power, but again, something that we can be useful. So I really like this conference because we're really trying to address that problem in a lot of the, the discussions we're having here. And I think, for example, there's much more things you can think about than just quantum annealing to try to see that power. And in fact, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk about a recent a proposal by our group that's just about to get on the archive where we're gonna do just that. We're gonna try to look at some kind of power of, of the quantum computer. And in fact, this particular experiment more sits in the digital domain with a gate model, with a shallow circuits, but with 50 qubits so that the two the 50 state space kind of shows you that you have you know, huge c computing power here. Yet we, we aren't gonna do anything useful right now, but we're gonna kind of show, uh, you know, show an example of how you might be able to put together, using the systems you have right now, something to, to, that could be very powerful. So I like to put it this way. Here we are, a bunch of physicists with a little dilution refrigerator. And we're going to do some kind of calculation on the 50 qubit system that, if we want to check it, is going to require the biggest supercomputer in the world to be able to check it. Okay, now we're not going to do something useful, we're just going to check it, but at least you, you, know, you can show that it's powerful. So that, I think, is pretty cool. So again, uh, this uh, it was proposed by the Google Theory Group, and Sergio, this afternoon, will talk about this in detail, and um, kind of good theoretical mathematical detail. I'm going to kind of discuss it on a high-level experimentalist view uh, and explain how it works. What's nice, it's a simple qubit test. Again, results checked by a supercomputer. And that, but you can do check it by about, up to about 42 to 50 qubits. At that point, you can't check it anymore, but you know, clearly you've shown it's, it's powerful. Demonstrates exponential processing power. You have this huge Hilbert space that you're operating on in, in the system, which I think is a good fundamental test of quantum computing. Sensitive and complex tests, it results fail if you have an error. So you really have to know about coherence. And it's a good test of scalable quantum processing. Uh, again, uh, you're testing it, you're testing your error models and the like. 
Okay, so here's the one slide that explains how to do it in seven easy steps, okay? And basically what we're doing is we're taking qubits and making uh, gates between all the qubits. These are control Zs and these are single qubit gates. And what we're gonna do is for a sequence of n qubits, we're gonna choose randomly gates here, from, choose a, take random picks from a gate set that either are Clifford's for um, the single qubits and control Z, which is a Clifford group on two qubit, and then we're gonna add in a non-Clifford to, to make it interesting. And then we're gonna run this algorithm and check it, okay. Now, I don't, I'm gonna explain this in a second, but what I'd like to do is kind of explain this in a very simple way using a laser. And what I have here is a um, 300 milliwatt laser that you can only buy from China, okay? Now, and my credit card number was stolen, so be careful when you do that. <laughs> and to make it safe, this is really dangerous, I put a, um, a ground glass uh, little piece here that's gonna diffuse the light. Okay, and that's gonna, I'm not gonna point it at you, but that's gonna make it a little bit safer. And of course, if we had white light going through ground glass, it's gonna spread out the beam in a homogeneous way. But we have a coherent source here. So if you look at this, can we turn off this light here? It might be, be a little bit easier to see. You can see the light is spread out, but you see a speckle pattern. Can people see that? There are places, a little brighter, there are places here that is um, more intense, and there are places that's less intense, okay? And that basic physics is called a speckle, okay? And what's happening is you, have, you can turn the lights back on, that's the big demonstration. Um, you know about speckle, you've studied this. So what's happening, you have a coherent light source, and from the various paths going through the ground glass, there are times where it uh, coherently, uh, it's, it's um, interfering constructively to give you bright spots and destructively to give you dark spots. And it has to do with it's a coherent beam. Now, if I um, wanted to, you know, I could measure this beam, okay? And I could, knowing the ground glass surface, I could calculate what that beam should be. And I should be able to measure the beam and calculate the beam and get the right answer. And in fact, if I knew enough information about that, I could calculate the response of this. And given that there's n pixels here, it would take about n squared operations. It's not that hard to do. That's a classically tractable problem. However, when you, instead of doing light speckle, you do qubit speckle, okay, where you're running through these random gates and getting kind of a random output, um, that is a two to the n hard computational problem. And what we're gonna do in the quantum supremacy is, com is measure uh, the qubit speckle and then compare it to calculation. Now when you get qubit speckle, the intensity of the speckle is proportional to the probability that you're going to measure it. So what we're gonna do is as we measure all the possible states, you're gonna pick out the bright spots. And we're gonna get that information of the bright spots and say, okay, is that what we predicted in the bright spots of the theory? And that's the algorithm, okay? And clearly, if, if things are working right, we're gonna pick out spots that are gonna presumably be bright, and then we're gonna check them, and we're gonna see that that has higher probability. And that's basically the algorithm, okay? The, the check part of the algorithm. So let's go ahead now and then go through the math now that I've kind of explained how it works. So what we're gonna do is take this circuit and, uh, um, okay, and we're gonna measure a K and I'm gonna call K that bit stream, an integer that runs from two to the N minus one. So it's a huge number of, of out, uh, possible outputs. And we're gonna repeat and sample this about 100,000 times to get a lot of statistics. And in our next version of the quantum computer, that should take about a second. So it's about 10 microseconds per cycle through. We could do that really fast. So in a second, we get huge amounts of data. Now, it's a random circuit, so you would guess classically that you would have a random guess and any outcome K has a probability P classical over two to the N. But I'm telling you, if you do a quantum mechanical calculation, which is just running this through a supercomputer, you're gonna find an N side and you're gonna get a probability K and uh, you're gonna store it in some kind of lookup table and then you're going to compare it. 
And uh, what I say is to calculate this for 45 to 50 qubits might take days, and it's a huge amount of data, okay? Uh, that's gonna go maybe on 200 state-of-the-art drives, although I would recommend using Google Cloud to sort the data. That's a much better solution. But if it's big enough, you, you aren't even wanna be able to store it on Google Cloud. I mean, it's just too big. So you may just store, you compute it, and then just store the ones that you found here. But this is the trick, this is the really beautiful idea. Uh, you do a cross entropy calculation. You take the k's that you measure, and for those k's you find the p's that you computed here. And then you compare that to p classical. Now if you were to randomly choose k, the, the random choice of k would give you a random p, which would be p classical, and this number would be one. But since you're taking the bright ones here and you're plugging it into a matching bright ones here, this is gonna be bigger than P classical. And then this number, this ratio is gonna be bigger than one. And in fact, the theory is that when you work it out in detail and do all the statistics, this cross entropy is minus 0.58 of its classical and 0.42 of its quantum. So you can readily tell what's going on. And the statistically, since you're taking a million events, you know very easily whether it's quantum or classical. Okay, so you did that for one sequence. Then, of course, you try another sequence. You know, one data point is not good enough. And you go through this all again. And you keep doing this until you run out of money because this is taking days on a supercomputer. I mean, this is totally trivial. A second. So the, the quantum part is trivial, and this is your limiting step. Of course, that's what's cool about it. So let's kind of explain a little bit more how this thing is working. Okay. If you take, I think this is a, for 36 qubits, you just take the index from 0 to 2 to the n, you get probabilities that are this kind of distribution. And this is actually an exponential distribution here. And this is the P classical right here. So this is just the output of a computer program. And this uh, exponential distribution actually comes from the fact that the real and imaginary amplitude is Gaussian distributed. And then uh, from that, you actually get an exponential uh, uh, probability distribution. And what you can do is you take all those k's and sort them from low probability to high probability. And that sorted is given here. And if you tilt your head to the left, this is probability and this is um, a number, and this is an exponential curve here. So this is indeed this exponential distribution. Okay, and that's you know, telling you that's what we were claiming. Now, this is the interesting thing. You put one error into the circuit, okay? And then you, you measure it at the end and you get this blue line, which is basically flat. So one error totally destroys the coherence and you won't see this quantum effect anymore. And again, this is the fragility to power and the fragility of quantum mechanics. So you can just say this cross entropy is just the probability of no error times this S value that I told you before, and, and that's the probability here. And then the probability of error for given single and two qubit measurements, you can work this out easily, and it's basically called as E to the number, the total number of errors in your circuit. And so that this number here, it's, you can see some quantum effect. You want n to be less than one, or practically you know, less than three or so. So the experiment uh, you do is, is you're going to measure uh, s total minus this s classical, which goes from 0 to 1. And then as long as your errors are small, you'll be able to see s greater than 0. And you're going to claim uh, uh, quantum supremacy. Uh, if this you know, errors are too small, this is too small. And, you, you know, you won't be able to uh, figure out that it's going. So it's, it's a very simple test like that. So experimentally, uh, you could do this in a 1D chain with 49 qubits. We know how to make a 1D chain. But in order to entangle the n qubits, you kind of have to do 49 control Zs to get the states to talk to each other. And uh, given what we're doing now, that's, that's NE would be 12. It wouldn't work very well. For a 2D array to get them to entangle uh, across the array, you're going to need square root of n, or about 7. And for error 2, that looks doable. OK? That's something we do. Now, it's going to take more depth of the circuit 
then probably seven due to some details. So I think we're going to have to improve upon this number. But I'm just saying that this is within reach for us to do. And it's you know, one of the experiments we're trying. And it's good to you know, push us to get the, the coherence. Just to let you know, we have done complex sequences with 1,000 gates, which is within that. So we know how to do the control. Uh, in terms of get it out of a 2D array, we have bump bonding working, superconducting bump bonds with 1,000 bump bonds working all the time. So we think we know how to build it. Just it's hard to put it all together, and that's something you know we're going to work on. Okay, so that's that's the end of my talk. Let's my, uh, summarize. Um, um, you know, as we think about doing something practical, I think the adiabatic quantum computing is a great direction, and you know we're thinking about it. Really, really interesting. Um, it's possible maybe you could do something with digital. And okay, right now we're kind of want to demonstrate this exponential state space. And you kind of see if it works. And you know, although that's kind of a, just a theoretical and a scientific advance, um, I would claim that there's something useful to this. Because I think if you were to show this and show that you're needing a supercomputer to check it, that would be very useful in the fact that you would convince a lot of Silicon Valley executives that this is like the technology is maybe going somewhere. You know, and, and in Google, that's, that's kind of cool to do that. Um, and also, I would say, well, OK, we have this random algorithm. But can some smart person out there think about a short algorithm that actually does some useful mathematical function? And uh, if that's the case, you know, we could maybe turn this into, into something. So it's kind of a, a call that people can do that. And you know, if you do come up with something, uh, we will definitely try that. And we're working on that, and we would do that. So you know, we're interested to see if people have any ideas. So uh, in that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, John. So uh, uh, the talk is open for questions, please. Oh. Well, I would like to say that I think there is evidence that there are low depth uh, circuit, uh, circuit model algorithms that may be of use for doing approximate optimization. And I mean, we, my group showed that such an algorithm uh, with very low depth could get an approximate solution to a combinatorial search problem. And for a short period of time, we were outperforming the best uh, classical algorithm, but then the classical computer scientists teamed up Ten, 10 against 3, and uh, improve their algorithm. And so we're, we differ by a log factor now from them. But our algorithm is at the lowest possible circuit depth, and we had those results. And if we increase the circuit depth, the performance will improve. So I would like to see someone build a quantum computer that executes a low circuit depth optimizer in the gate model. And um, I think people at Google are interested in variants of that, which also um, people are with this VQE. But I think there are things on the table which can be explored. And I, you know, I, I have my own shtick, but I think there are others. And I think we need to pay attention to these things now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Boris, please. Uh, I want to ask, uh, when you say you use uh, random sequence of gates, what does it mean, uh, random? I mean, are you averaging over different sequences, or you just choose no, you one? No, just, you just, for each element in there, you randomly choose a Clifford. And there, you may have to choose a little bit, a few, few more T gates. No, but you have to repeat. Uh, and then we, then we take that given sequence, and then we repeat it, like, say, 100,000 times. Yeah, but uh, is it clear that averaging over different sequences and averaging over different uh, repetitions are equivalent to each other? Well, every different sequence you choose, you will have to do a different supercomputer calculation to be able to compare the speckle pattern. Uh, and it, it should not matter. You know, you should be able to do this with one experiment and kind of show what's going on. But I think the, the community would like you to try it two, three, four times, you know, the show that generically. But I would say part of the, the interesting part is that this works for a randomly chosen circuit, 
which kind of shows that there's no information there that you can gain to build a classical uh, you know, simulator to kind of get that information because the, 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 the individual elements are chosen randomly. That's kind of the thinking there. All right, thank you. So we have time for one more question, please. There was one over here, I think. The video. Oh. oh, okay. Oh. Uh, I, the video. Just a clarification question on the errors that are required to destroy the, um, the effect. Right. Uh, how do you model this error? I mean, what kind of errors are you sensitive yes, to? Yes, so we have modeled them in the typical depolarization model scheme, where when you do the simulation, you just put in a, a random flip to, and to see what happens. And that's, of course, the way that we model things for uh, uh, you know, error correction and whatever. And what I would, it, it, it's nice because, you know, you can argue whether that's a good model or not. I mean, our data so far says it's a pretty good model, but we actually think this, this, um, this experiment is if a actually a good way to check whether those assumptions are fundamentally sound. Because we can kind of estimate the errors from single and two qubit experiments and then do this big experiment and see if it makes sense. So I think that would be very useful. All right, thank you very much. Let's send the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.